I want you to expect miracles to happen in your life. You must expect miracles to happen. You heard our brother say, one rhema word from God is able to transform situations forever. It's amazing. And for your kind information, this person that I spoke to you about a little earlier, who opened his heart before God's people and told how he is now living for the last three months free from debt, incidentally, will be the most pivotal person in the egg business in the days ahead. I don't know whether you understand what I'm saying. He will be the sole responsible man to airlift over 300 tons of eggs. 300 tons of eggs. It's amazing how God's word transforms lives. You just listen sometimes. You may not understand everything that's being said from here. But you just stay humble and do it. You see the word come to pass. One rhema word from God. I told you how we heard last week that brother come forward and say, I just held on to that statement and wrote down in my diary. If Leah could be buried with Abraham, Isaac and in that burial plot, and not be the despised one in her death, then I won't be uprooted. And he's already in Sydney. It all depends on how you approach God's word. You grab a hold of it. That sister came forward to testify. I don't know whether you knew who she was talking about. It's her cousin, right? Who used to come on Sundays and the other worship services Saturdays. She's already got a job. There are people struggling to hold on to jobs. She's got her job. Thank God for the mercy of God. You can write it down. Psalm 21 verse 7. Psalm 21 verse 7. For the king trusteth in the Lord, and through the mercy of El Elyon, the Most High, he shall not be moved. You want to be the rooted of the Lord? Cling to the mercy of the Lord. Blood mercy. Psalm 21 verse 7. He, you can write if it's always a problem in your mind, the gender in the Bible is always a he. You can write close to that she. Except from, for God, you can write she for all things. Now this morning we are going to continue our teachings on the setter of El Elyon or the hiding place of the Most High God. Stay long enough, I told you last week, to intercede for your family, loved ones and church. How long should I stay? Stay till you get your answers. Don't fool yourself. One time of fasting and prayer for a year is not good enough for you. If you want to see the miracle power of God in operation, then you've got to spend time with God yourself. Thank God for intercession. Thank God for prayer times like this where we stand with the church and pray. That is our responsibility. That's our duty as a Christian believer and a member of a local church. But on our own, we also need to spend time with God seeking His face. During that time, what do we pray for? We pray for so many things. But we also pray for our family, loved ones 
and church. I took you to 1 Samuel chapter 12 last week. And we saw the office of a prophet. The office of a prophet is not just foretelling the future. It is teaching the people of God the good and the right way. 1 Samuel chapter 12 verse 23 tells us so beautifully. Moreover as for me, this is Samuel talking to the people of God. God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. Do you know that not praying for others is a sin? There are times when I ask people who come up to me for prayer, do you pray for your pastor? And they start grinning. They think it's a big joke. Some of them look embarrassed at me. As though I asked them something very personal that they just can't answer. But in reality, they haven't prayed. And then in turn, they don't see answers come their way because they are not seeing the sin of not praying, hindering the flow of God's goodness in their life. It's not just smoking and drinking that is a sin. It's not just gambling or womanizing that's a sin. There is a sin that the Bible talks about, which is a sin against the Lord. And that is when a man stops praying for his brethren, for his family, for his loved ones, for the church of God. It is a sin. And then in verse 23, Samuel says, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he had done for you. Consider. Think about it. Don't sit and say, God didn't do anything for me. I'm not going to pray for anybody else. No, you start learning to pray for someone else. Today there is such an abuse about prayer that people shy away from prayer. They open their hearts and trust somebody to pray and that somebody becomes a gossip monger. And it hurts people in the body of Christ because the genuine people who pray find people shying away from prayer. And what we don't see is the sin. And these people walk around like self-righteous people all the time looking at themselves and saying, well, I'm not like so-and-so having this need or I'm not like so-and-so having that need. Please understand every man, woman and child on planet earth has a need. If they didn't have a need, there is no need for a savior. If they didn't have a need, there is no need for a healer. If they didn't have a need, there is no need for a deliverer. And man lacks the capacity to be savior, healer, deliverer, rolled into one. That's why we need a God to come in the form of a man and handle the needs of a man. And thank God we've seen it happen in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word made flesh who dwelt among us, Emmanuel. This is the good news. Now we're going to see some biblical examples of this. And I want you to turn with me please in your Bibles to the book of Acts. I want you to write down this because we will be looking at it in an extensive way. Note down the scripture portions. You don't pray just because you have the time to pray. You pray because you love to pray. And you make the time necessary for you to pray. Acts chapter 27. Look at verse 
9 onwards. Acts 27 verse 9 onwards. Have a highlighter in your hands also as you follow because you can mark certain key words. Now when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already passed Paul admonished them and said unto them Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage not only of the lading and ship but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. A seasoned traveler is speaking clearly words to the centurion. Very clearly he is saying, if we embark on this trip, it's going to be a problem for the goods, for the ship, and for the people's lives. Did the centurion believe who is the question? He believed the master and the owner of the ship. Now I want you to see something. The Bible uses a word to describe what Paul said. He was not a negative speaker. He said, I perceive. You can only perceive in your spirit. It is a word that is connected to your inner man. And this is what we teach you. That God will speak to you if you will care to listen. He didn't know anything else. He did not know how many kilometers into the sea this thing is going to happen. Or on which day it's going to strike. All that he knew was that inner man of his said, danger. This trip going to become a problem. Having known it, he went to the centurion. And I wanted to see so clearly the protocol that this prisoner held on to. Remember Paul was a prisoner. Not a traveler on the ship. Not a tourist on the ship. He went to the authority under which he was. He went to the centurion. So you learn a lot from this. And that's the reason why you see this man being able to tell us pray for the government. Can I have an amen from this church? Pray for the government. Let's keep reading please. Nevertheless the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And because the heaven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they, may, they might attain to Finis and there to winter, which is an heaven of Crete, and lie towards the southwest and northwest. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. Why is it dangerous to go by external evidences? Because the wind can blow softly before the storm. Can I have an amen from this church please? The wind can blow ever so softly before a storm. And I want you to write it down please. That's the danger with people who look at external evidences. I'll tell you something, if you learn to listen to God in your spirit, 
you have the answers to most things that confront you on planet earth. You look for outside evidence, you can be cheated. You can be deceived into thinking all is okay, let me proceed. When all may not be okay. Now let's read. But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind. Now where's the soft wind? That's the question. Where's the soft wind? The tempestuous wind was what Paul perceived. The soft wind was what he felt on the outside. I want you to write it down. You can feel a lot of things on the outside. But listen to what your inner man tells you. Because that is God communicating to your spirit. That's why I keep asking people. What is God telling you? I am not asking him or her. What is God showing you on the outside? I am asking the individual. What is God telling you? In the inner man. That's where God speaks. And that's what we are training ourselves to learn as well. So the soft wind was what everybody felt on the outside. The tempestuous wind is what Paul heard God say in the inner man. That's why God is a God who communicates his plan and purpose to you on the inside. Learn to listen. The more you train yourself to listen to that inner unction of the spirit of God, after a point of time it becomes the very voice of God. You will hear clearly. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship. And fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, struck sail and so were driven. Now this is the danger. When you go by outside evidence, you will be driven at the mercy of the winds. You like it? That's not a very wise Christian stand. You must hate it. You must hate it. Look at that please. They were driven. They didn't have any control. Where the wind blew. Blue, they went. And we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest the next day, they lightened the ship. The third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. Now this is a place where every hand is required to work. You can imagine... One part of what was happening on the ship was not spoken about. The retching ceremony must, which must have been on. The vomit that must have been spewing the decks. The kind of sea sickness that must have been on. And yet every hand work. Because it's your life that is at stake. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. Now what do you do when all hope is lost? God has spoken something to your spirit. He is warned about a situation and yet there was 
this situation that grew in your life that you were just pulled into, sucked into. Because nobody wanted to listen to you. What would a man who is serving God do? What Paul did. He's a wise man. In the midst of the storm, there wouldn't have been much of a place to go alone and pray. Yet, Paul fasted and prayed. That became the setter of the Most High God. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and, say, and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. I wanted to mark these words. When you don't listen to that inner voice, there is harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but off the ship. Now you can turn the tide around if you know how to fast and pray. Initially he said, there would be loss of lives. Now after fasting and humbling himself and seeking the face of God, that's what you sang about a little earlier. Seeking your face, touching your grace. He said, the ship will have loss, but there will be no loss of life. That's the good news. Will fasting and prayer help? Yes. Who was Paul fasting for is the question. Not for his life. He was fasting and praying for every man's life on the ship. The centurion included. Dr. Luke included. The others in Paul's company included. To him, they were family. In times of crisis. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. Verse 23. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. Saying, fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God had given thee one man's intercession, one man's spending time in the setha meant all the difference for every person on that ship that day. God had given you. We thought they had Paul bound. Now God saying, no, 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 your prayer has bound them from danger. It's like a safety net around every person. God had given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. For I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. The first time God spoke was how? Not through the angel. Through the inner witness. The angelic visitation came under great Stress and strain of personal life. Not before that. And that too, after much fasting. Nearly 14 days fast. How be it, we must be cast upon a certain island. Now this is a revelation. But when the 49th was come and was, and. As we were driven up and down in Adria about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country and sounded and found it twenty fathoms. 
And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it fifteen fathoms. Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. I wanted to see something here. Oh, I wish God would do this. Oh, I wish God would do that won't help you. This wishbone that people hold on to when they eat chicken during lunch and dinner doesn't help anybody get their prayers answered. Prayers are answered when you pray knowing whose you are and whom you serve. Sometimes you see people all the time discovering a little bit of thin chicken bone and they'll stretch it out and say, come, come, hold this bone. I'll tell you, if the chicken was able to wish, the chicken would have wished itself out of your plate. But the chicken can't wish itself out of your plate because you have dominion over two-legged creatures. Hallelujah. And you can exercise dominion. Wishes don't come to pass. Prayers do. Intercessions do. All that these people could do, because they never knew the living God. They could only wish for day to come. But look at the man who knew God. What he did. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea under color, as though they would have cast anchors out of the four ship. Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, what? Except these abide in the center. You cannot be saved. Don't sit and think you can have your own contingency plans to escape the crisis. You must remain in the center of God. Till the storm is past. Till deliverance comes from the throne of grace. There will be no shortcuts. So the people shake their heads here. That every time crisis strikes. They have little petty boats out there on the sea. Wanting to jump out of where God has placed them. And into those tiny little rafts. That they think can save them. They will not save anybody. Follow very carefully. Except these abide. Right close to that Psalm 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. El Elyon. Shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat. They had enough sense to listen to this man. Because this man is speaking wisdom. And let her fall off. Cast away all those useless, petty boats of escape. Cut the ropes off them. Stay put in the sether of God. And see the deliverance of God. Because he will show you what to do. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat. One man is in complete control. I thought he was the prisoner. When you spend time in the sether, everybody will start listening to you. Sometimes people think the key to overcoming opposition in an organization is to act smart. You act smart, you'll get burnt. You will smart for your foolishness. But if you learn to spend time with God in prayer, then when you come out into the open and you begin to speak the wisdom of God, everybody listens to you. At Paul's behest, the soldiers cut the ropes off the boats. You can imagine what they were doing. They were saying, we'll trust this man with our lives because he's been with God. Can I have an amen please? We'll trust this man with our lives because he has been with life himself. That's what the setter is really. The setter is not a time of a bore. 
where you feel bored and bored and bored because you prayed and prayed and prayed and nothing happens. No, when you spend time with God, you begin to hear from heaven. Heaven's answers begins to flow from God to you. And it's no more a bore. When you speak, there is response. When you speak, people begin to say, this man's been with God. We can trust our lives. Where he is, life will be flowing. Where he is, miracles will happen. Where he is, the power of God will be evident. Let's keep reading, please. And that's you. We're talking about you. And why you need to pray. Now this man, in the midst of all the confusion, is saying, Take meat. Eat something. This day is the 14th day that you have tarried and continued fasting and having taken nothing. So there is something called a 14 day fast in the New Testament. You will read about different types of fast. 3 day fast, 7 day fast, 14 day fast, 21 days fast and then a 40 day fast. 14 days taken when? Not for fun. When life was in danger. Look at verse 34. And this is something that no man can say in the ordinary sense of the term because he was actually controlling nature at that point of time. I don't know whether you think about it. Every day hair falls off our heads. Yes or no? Some hair falls off your head. Nearly every day. Wishing it away won't help. It's natural for hair to fall. Even in a healthy man's head and scalp, every day there is a loss of hair. Now for this period of time, Paul is temporarily suspending the power of nature to work. This is not just a figure of speech. This is not a figure of speech. Let's read what he said. What did he say? After having prayed so long, he said, Wherefore I pray you take some meat, for this is for your health. That means even in fasting and praying, God is interested in your health. Not in your deterioration of health. God wants you to be healthy and strong. He doesn't want you breaking your body. That is not fasting and prayer. That is destroying the temple of God. Some people do it in such a way that they destroy the very purpose behind a fast. The meat is for your health. You have fasted and prayed. There's been a time of great physical stress and strain, mental tension. Now break the fast. Eat something. It is for your health. For there shall not a hair fall from the head of any of you. It's a guarantee. You must understand we, were, we are talking about superstitious people on the boat, on the ship, sorry. People who would have attributed anything to being a retribution from an angry God. And this man is saying, please listen. All of you know that hair falls? Well, let me tell you something. You eat now according to my word and nothing will fall. God Almighty will preserve you to such an extent. Because the God I serve is a God who has already told me there is not a single hair from your head that falls to the ground that your father in heaven doesn't know about. And there is a suspension of natural laws because that's what a miracle is. Can I have an amen from this church? What is a miracle? A miracle is a suspension of natural laws because of a divine intervention of God where God divinely intervenes it's not normal for the sun and the moon to stand still in one place. Think about it. Suspension. 
of laws. It's not natural for the sun to go back on the sundial. But when there's a suspension of laws, what you say will come to pass. Can I have an amen? Follow carefully. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread, gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. Can you believe this? Here is a man, having spent time with God, is having thanksgiving in his heart in the midst of crisis. That is the worshipper that God is looking for, who has already started worshipping him even as the storm is still on. It's not easy. But that's the worshipper that God is looking for, not the worker. Jesus didn't say the workers will worship, work for God in spirit and in truth. He said the worshippers, God is seeking for such people. They will worship him in spirit and in truth. So it's not that everything is good, so I give thanks to God. No, when everything is not good, you give thanks to God. Someone was speaking to me and bringing my attention to this fact all over again. We worship the Lord and there is tremendous power loosed. Extended time of worship doesn't matter. Shorter time taken for miracles to manifest. They begin to manifest left, right and center. Look at this. He is giving thanks and breaking bread and setting the pace of what takes place on the ship. Prisoners are not the ones fed first. Soldiers are. Here is a man standing in the midst of soldiers who wouldn't think twice to knock off his head. And in complete control he breaks bread having given thanks to God. And when he had broken it, he began to eat first. Can you imagine the shock on people's faces? They must have been waiting for the next strong gust of wind to blow. Nothing blew. Can I have an amen? That's how you read the Bible. You make the Bible just the way it ought to be. Most of us read the Bible and think, my God, this is the most per perfect scenario. We don't bring it down to our level where we see the storms of life blow. Where the gusts of wind that were blowing softly all of a sudden turn and become so tempestuous that it doesn't look like we're going to make it one minute longer. Forget about one day, one minute longer. You don't have the strength to go on. Then, were they all of good cheer? Listen, the word good cheer is mentioned three times there. Twice it was spoken by Paul. Finally, it was translated into the hearts of the people who watched him. Then, were they all of good cheer? They must have started cheering and shouting and breaking into laughter. This is the miracle of God. Is the storm still on? Is the sea still choppy? Yes. But people have started rejoicing already. Hallelujah. That's what happens when you come out of the setter of God. You have an answer from God. And the answer is, the storm will not last much longer. Hallelujah. The storm will not last much longer. Your sorrow shall be turned into joy. Your days of mourning are ended. And I don't know why I'm continually speaking this out. Someday someone is going to hear these words and draw strength for a miracle. And they also took the word sum is written in italics, some meat. 
And we were all, we were in all in the ship, 200, three score and 16 souls, 276 people on the ship. Can you believe one man is changing the destiny of 276 people on the ship? Unknown people's destinies are changed by one man's prayer. When you're talking about you, today you come here set apart this day to pray. You didn't come here to play games. You didn't come here to listen to your own opinions reconfirmed from the pulpit. No, you came here to hear the voice of God, the word of God that will transform your life. And that's what was prayed anyhow. I didn't come here to just listen to my own opinions. I want to hear from God. I want to hear and see what the Lord has for me, personally, for this church, for this ministry. What is he going to do in the days ahead? How are things going to go? And when they would eaten enough, they lightened the ship and cast out the wheat into the sea. Can you see that? They are casting wheat into the sea. What is wheat anyhow? Seed? Can I have an amen from this church please? You can sow your way out of a crisis. If you learn to cast your wheat into the sea. Like you cast your bread upon the waters. Hallelujah. Some people say well this was just done to lighten the ship. Well they didn't know what they were doing. But what they were doing had a principle behind it. That we know works today. It works. You name your seed and you put it and see how God works the miracle. The barren become productive. The ones in debt come out of debt. The ones needing a financial breakthrough begin to see a financial breakthrough. In a time of financial crisis, God is answering their prayer. I mean, this is no joke. People who don't know which direction to turn begin to get direction. From their inner being, they know, no, let me go on this road. This is the place that God wants me to be. Because this is mentioned in verse 38. I want you to see it and write it down. Seed. Wheat. Amazing. Ecclesiastes 11.1 1. Cast thy bread upon the waters. Now here only one amen. What about the rest? You say it's too precious to cast? Too precious to sow? Too precious for me to give away? Well, that's what the Bible says you got to do. You sow precious seed, you're going to come back with a harvest of blessing. When it's precious, it makes the harvest even more special. Cast out the wheat into the sea. And when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into which they were minded if it were possible to thrust in the ship. They saw a creek. And they thought, well, let's put the ship into the creek. And when they taken up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea and loosed the rudder bands and hoisted up the mainsail to the wind and made towards shore. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground. And the fore part stuck fast and remained unmovable. But the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. So you can see the kind of natural circumstances that were still on. 
and yet the people have no harm come to them. Now everybody is eating and nobody is throwing up. Can I have an amen from this church please? And I'm talking to you people who have problems with travel sickness. If you're wise, you'll grab a hold of what I'm saying and say, Lord, no more travel sickness in my life. In Jesus' name. I will never have ass sickness. I will never have sea sickness. I will never have sickness when I travel on the road. I will be free from it in Jesus' name. And you can believe the same for anyone in your family. No travel sickness in Jesus' name. You think your kid always throws up when he or she enters into the car? Well, just thank God that that person will never see it happen again in Jesus' name. Now people are eating and no one's throwing up. The violence of the waves are so much that the ship is literally on one side stuck firm, unmovable. The next part of the ship, the hinder part of the ship moves. You can imagine the creaking sound. Of those timbers as they are moved from one side to another side. Till such a tremendous thing happens. There is a tearing horrible sound. The hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. And the soldiers counsel was to kill the prisoners. Lest any of them should swim out and escape. Now I want you to make a note of this please. The soldier's counsel versus God's wisdom. I mean you can preach the end number of sermons from this portion of scripture and never fail to see the goodness of God and the wisdom of God. Soldier's counsel versus the wisdom of God. Soldier's counsel is that they never thought Something like this would be possible. What? In a crisis, the prisoners will escape. They didn't know who was standing in their midst had already controlled prisoners at Philippi earlier. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. And I'm speaking something in the spirit realm. I don't even know why I'm raising my voice and speaking. But there are things happening in the spirit world. This very moment in the name of the Lord. In the name of Jesus. Standing in their midst was the one who had seen prison doors fly open. Earthquake come. The Philippi jailer was about to cut his neck and kill himself. Thinking everybody had already taken off running. Paul said don't touch your life. Every one of us is here. What kept those prisoners there? The high praises of God. In the mouth of one man, along with his partner, who sang and worshipped the Lord while they were in the prison. Hallelujah. Now that's the man who's standing there, still in charge. And I'll tell you this, and I'm telling it to you, I don't even know why I'm saying this, but if you'll spend time in the setter of God, you will find the power of God working on your behalf. What people would naturally be inclined to do at that point of time because of your word, they'll refuse to do it. And they'll choose to go with the wisdom of God rather than the counsel of the devil or of man. Look at this please. And the soldier's counsel was to kill the prisoners. Why? Lest any of them should swim out and escape. They thought the fellows will run away. And then it will be their life for each prisoner. But the centurion willing to save Paul. Hallelujah. 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 Salvation in the midst of crisis. The wisdom of God saving the anointed of God. The wisdom of God saving the man who would spend time with God. Kept them from their purpose. Hallelujah. And commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. What an order. What a trust. Much against his training. Here is a centurion saying, who can swim? Prisoner 1, prisoner 10, 
Prisoner 15 will jump in and swim first to the land. What do you mean, sir? That's not our order. If we leave these men, it's our life for these men. Centurion looks at the man and says, listen to me, soldier. He goes first. He can swim. There will be no loss of life. There will be no loss of prisoner as well. Can we have an amen from this church? That's how you take charge in your office. That's how you take charge in your business. That's how you take charge in your educational institution. Not by sitting and blabbering nonsense, but by first spending time with God and then coming out with the wisdom of God. There is really a solution for the dilemmas that people face every day. And the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. And they were all standing there and waiting for the others to come. I like that. This is how I read my Bible. That's what makes the difference in people's lives. It's not the miracle of the healing of the TB patient a little later. It's this which is a miracle. People who are prisoners who are naturally inclined to run away will sit and listen to your word. There are no chains to bind them except the presence of God on you. Hallelujah. Miracles will happen. Signs and wonders will take place. We came here to hear from God. I believe he's spoken. How do you believe it? He said earlier, my doctrine will fall and settle on the earth as a dew from heaven. With a strong arm and a mighty hand, I will deliver my people. That is a verse that my spiritual mother guided me for the most part of my early Christian life. Used to always pray when she would pray for people. Stretched out hand and a mighty arm. He will lead and deliver. He will set free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're in a crisis. You will see the Christ in you rise tall when you spend time with him in prayer. Don't sit and say, but I've come week after week. Nothing really happened. Well, you're closer to your miracle now than you were when you first came. Hallelujah. You're closer to your miracle now than when you first came. It's not the waves of the violence of the waves that matters. Have you noticed something? Such a violent wave was there. People jumped in and swam and still made it. You don't swim when the waves are very violent. You can break your back. Your spinal cord will just snap. If you don't know what to do in a choppy sea. Now these were all not ordinary men. These were men who had swam earlier because they knew how to swim. And yet, the violence of the waves was so strong that naturally they couldn't have done it. They did it because of one man spending time with God. And thank God for the others who were with him. Luke, Dr. Luke, who recorded this for us. His witness is a credible witness. The others who were traveling with the Apostle Paul who also saw what happened. The mercy of the waves is no mercy at all. But the mercy of God is the tender blood mercies of God. To be driven at the mercy of the wind is for you to be ultimately destroyed. That's the purpose of the wind. To destroy, to break. To bring loss and harm. Remember those two words. Loss and harm. 
loss of lives, harm to goods. But thank God for the tender blood mercies of God. Can we all lift up holy hands please? Lift up holy hands and give thanks to God loudly. Hallelujah. Thank God for the tender blood mercies of God. 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 Lift up holy hands please. Lift up holy hands please. Give God the glory. Give God the glory. Give God the glory. Thank him for the blood. Hallelujah. 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 We thank you for the blood Lord. Oh the precious blood of Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. The precious blood of Jesus. I want you to take your prayer points in your hands please. The storm may not have passed as yet. The winds may be blowing real bad. And the waves may be still choppy. But remember when you spend time with God. You can be of good cheer. You can be rejoicing in the midst of trial and testing. I wanted to take your prayer points in your hands. Everybody has prayer points, me included. I said me included. I need a savior, I need a healer, I need a deliverer. You need a savior, you need a healer, you need a deliverer. You have your prayer points with you. Lift it up before the Lord and pray. Seek his face. Touch his grace. That's more than just a song. Someone was just explaining to me some time ago how, how a little child that this individual knows hardly one and a half, two years old but when his mother looks at him in a stern way immediately the child will come and hug the mother give the mother a kiss and use those little tiny fingers of his to tickle her chin just to make her to laugh. I was just thinking about it. Praise and worship is just that. You tickle the face of God. You worship him and thank him in the midst of every kind of crisis. You make his face smile and his countenance break forth in smile. Into a smile on your face. That's when you go out from the sitter into which you have entered with the favor of God. The countenance of God on your face. Hallelujah. It's not the soft blowing wind on your hand that makes the difference. It is the wind of God's spirit and his guidance in your life that makes you a servant of almighty God. Gives you direction and purpose for living. I want you to take your prayer point in your hand and begin to intercede. Intercede and pray. I said intercede and pray. And I believe the Lord for a miracle. You want an answer to prayer? Pray and say, Father, in Jesus' name, I want an answer in this area. 